My name is Ari Edwards, and this is Too Scared, a horror anthology podcast featuring terrifying tales from talented authors. This episode, I'm excited to introduce the first of a series by Reddit user Arudius. Part one is titled, Grandpa's Friend Was a Tree. To get notified when a new episode of Too Scared is published, please consider subscribing and turning on your notifications. Too Scared is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Just search for Too Scared with Ari Edwards. So, do you want to hear a story? My grandpa has been going through a lot lately. After grandma died, he kind of went a little mushy. We were asked to come and get him one night after he was found wandering near his house, and the police suggested that we might want to have someone keep an eye on him. Since I was just sitting around the house and doing nothing with my life, my parents extended the idea that this might give me a little freedom, since I had recently been chafing under my father's rules. They gave me rules, of course, like no using my grandfather's house for wild parties, no sneaking girls in at all hours of the night, and my grandfather's safety would always come first. If we get another call about him wandering off, he'll be off to the nursing home, and you will be moving back home. So I moved my things in with my grandpa, and we became roommates. Grandpa was a pretty good roommate, all things considered. I lived upstairs in the loft. Grandpa had a loft-style house with a whole other dwelling upstairs, and he lived downstairs since it was hard for him to get up and down. I did most of the cooking and the cleaning. Grandpa bought the groceries and the beer, though that was our little secret, and we lived in harmony most days. The only thing that annoyed me was all the stories. Don't get me wrong, Grandpa had a lot of good stories. He had been in the Gulf War, he had driven trucks in Alaska on treacherous roads, and had spent almost all his life in the Appalachian Mountains. In fact, this house had been his childhood home. He had many stories about camping, exploring, and roaming the woods around the property. Those I didn't mind so much. There were many nights that Grandpa and I would sit on the porch with a case of beer and he would tell me stories of exploring the woods and discovering its majesty. It was the lies that he would tell sometimes. He made some pretty outlandish claims about the woods that I just couldn't shake off. He claimed to have met a Sasquatch, running for his life as it chased him from its part of the woods. He had seen forest spirits and spent a month in their camp, as time moved differently there. He had met animal people, spoken with pale, moonlight guardians that live underground, and many other things. It wasn't just drunken tales, either. Those I could have forgiven. But he would ambush you sometimes with these strange little stories. You'd be washing dishes or cleaning the living room or brushing your teeth, and suddenly he'd be right behind you with some tall tale. I mostly rolled my eyes at these stories, but last night he had told me something truly ridiculous. my best friend Ren turned into a tree. I had choked a little on my beer and finally set it down. I was a little drunk and maybe shouldn't have been so frustrated, but these stories were becoming a bit much. I had heard all manner of stories from Grandpa and just sort of shrugged them off or politely listened to them. But this one was so bizarre that it took me by surprise. His friend had turned into a tree? What the hell did that mean? Your friend turned into a tree, I challenged. Grandpa nodded and took another swig of beer. How, Grandpa? Tell me how a person turns into a tree. He looked thoughtful. It's kind of a long story. Are you sure you have time for it? I was off the next day and I nodded. Yeah, I would say I have time for it. He finished his beer and threw the bottle into the woods. 
hearing it break against a nearby tree. This was a habit he had kept from my childhood, and no one seemed to be able to break him of it. The funny thing was that despite him smashing the bottles, I never found any glass in the woods around his house. I always assumed that my grandma had cleaned it up, but I had continued to find no glass with Grandma gone. Just one of life's little mysteries, I told myself. And so, Grandpa began his odd tale. When I was about nine, a new boy moved into the valley. His name was Renault, but I always just called him Ren. His family was from the Bayou, Louisiana, and he was unsure of how things were in the Appalachians. Still, I was glad for a new playmate since our closest neighbor was about five miles in either direction, and we played in the hills and forests around our homes. Ren liked to find bugs and small spiders and put them in jars so he could study them. Ren fancied himself something of a scientist, and the Appalachian forests offered him much to explore. Now, the woods were always open to me. Mama never told us we couldn't explore, but Grandma had warned me never to go into the southern grove without her. It was beautiful there. The forest old and different somehow from the rest of the sprawling valley. I would ask her why I couldn't explore there alone. And she would say that it was dangerous if you didn't know what to touch and what to leave well enough alone. Like this, she had said, pointing to a thick, almost honey-like sap that was oozing from a nearby tree. That is the sap of an old calabash tree. You must never touch it, for if you do, not even I can help you. I asked her why, and she said that her grandma had told it to her, and hers had told it to her. It's just one of those rules that we follow, one of those rules we don't question. Ren was inquisitive. He wanted to explore everything. And he noticed that we were avoiding that particular stretch of forest. I had told him some stories about the place when we first met. That there were two-headed beetles that lived there, about the strange flowers and technicolor patterns, and the large trees that my grandmother had always called calabashes. He asked me to take him there not really feeling comfortable exploring the woods alone yet. He was never far from my side when we were in the woods, and he asked me specifically one afternoon if we could go out there. We were young, ten at the most, and I didn't take much convincing. I had tried to remain steadfast, not wanting anything to happen since I never went there without Grandma, but he finally broke me down. I agreed to take him. But I said he had to do what I said. Don't touch nothing, I told him. Especially if I say so. He promised he wouldn't, and we had set off for the grove. We stopped at his house before setting out, and he came back with a backpack that clinked a little as he walked. I had little doubt that it was full of specimen jars and other such things. He may not have intended to touch, but he definitely intended to study. So we made our way to the grove, and as soon as he saw the oddly colored flowers, he was in love. The grove is a special place, you see. Things there are closer to nature than anywhere else. And Grandma always said it was easier to feel the old world in places like the grove. They had a connection to the earth, a connection to the magic, and the people who spent a lot of time there can sometimes hear the voices of the forest that others have forgotten. When Grandma read Robert Frost, she thought maybe he had found some sort of grove of his own. We spent an hour just exploring the grove. Ren looked at the beetles, putting one in a jar so he could study it later, and sketching some of the plants as he made notes. I showed him the calabash tree, that massive white gold giant, and saw the wonder in his eyes that was there every time he found a bug or a leaf he didn't recognize. He approached it, and I understood his need to touch it. I myself had needed to touch it the first time I had really understood what I was seeing. It's the size of it, you see. Your mind tells you that nothing that big can possibly be real. But once you touch it, 
you know it must exist. It wasn't until I saw him take out his knife that I realized his intent. I ran forward telling him not to, but he seemed mesmerized by the gold bark of the towering tree. He wanted some, that much was obvious. But Grandma had always made it very clear that you did not strip bark from the calabash tree. Ren didn't know. He probably assumed that a tree so large would have plenty of bark. He couldn't have known what lay beneath. As his knife slid easily into the soft bark of the calabash tree, a gold spurt of sap struck him in the face. He stumbled back, the sap flowing as his knife quivered in the side of the massive trunk, and I saw him clutch his face and scream. I pulled him away from the tree, the roots threatening to trip him, and as his hands came down I could see that his face was changing. His face was turning brown, his skin thickening, and the pigment of his eyes was beginning to film over as though he was blind. What's happening? Ren asked, his voice deepening as his throat stiffened. I didn't know, but I knew what I had to do. I left his bag on the ground, the jars slamming together angrily, and I pulled him onto my shoulders. We were about three miles into the woods, but Ren wasn't very heavy. He was small, even for a ten-year-old, and I pulled him onto my back and I carried him with very little effort. We ran heading for my grandmother's house. Grandma would know what to do. She could save him. As I ran, I just knew that if I could get him there, she would save him. We hadn't gone far when he started getting heavier. Like I said, he wasn't large, but I was only ten, and Ren started getting heavy. The boy was light when we left the grove, me walking as I balanced him on my back, but he became heavier and heavier as we walked. His arms hung uselessly at my sides, and his body became like a stone on my back. My legs started to shake as my progress was slowed to a crawl. When I was drawn up short, I thought maybe one of his feet had caught on something. I looked back and almost dropped him. His feet had elongated until it drug up behind me, and his toes were becoming long and searching. They were pushing their way down into the ground, and as I pulled, they attempted to root themselves in the dirt. I pulled him along trying my best to get him to my grandmother, but eventually, I just couldn't take him any further. We were in a clearing. A stream trickling through that I knew would be a heavy little crossing with the winter flow, and I left him there, saying I would go get help. Ren called me back and asked me to stay with him. I told him I couldn't do that. If I gave up, he'd be stuck like this. My grandma knew about these sorts of things, and she might be able to help him. I made all kinds of excuses, but in the end, I was just scared. This was so weird, so odd, and my ten-year-old brain didn't know what to do about it. He said please and asked me to stay, his voice cracking like a branch on a high wind. And after some hesitation... I sat and said I would. His arms and legs were now stiff, bark-like, and he cried tears of yellow sap. I wanted to reach out and wipe them, but I remembered what that sap had done to him and resisted. His feet were growing, breaking the ground and sliding into the earth as they sought perches. I asked how he was feeling, and he said it was very strange. He said that, as he grew, everything seemed to slow down, to lengthen, and he was filled with an odd sense of eternity. He said he felt ancient and brand new. He felt lonely, yet filled with the knowledge that he was never alone. He felt sad for the life he was leaving behind, and excited for the life that was beginning. The process took about twenty minutes from start to finish, and I sat with him as he changed not wanting him to go through this alone. His skin thickened, taking on a wooden cast as his legs descended into the earth. His chest expanded, Ren groaning as his bones and his body grew, and his small arms were thrust upward as he reached for the sky. His face and body sort of grew into one, becoming his trunk, and his eyes began to sink into his newly formed trunk. 
much too soon. He was a tree. And I was left sitting beside a half-growing sapling with a pair of expressive rings on its trunk. I sat there, mouth agape, as Grandpa finished his story. What happened after that? Surely no one believed that Rend had turned into a tree. Only one person. My family and his spent the night searching the woods with a search party from town. They thought that something had happened and my brain had made up something to cope with it. They could see I was shaken by whatever had happened, and they still wanted to find Ren and make sure he was okay. I tried to tell them. I tried to explain what had happened, but my grandma appeared at that moment and wrapped an arm around me. She told them she would watch me while the town searched and took me into her house for cocoa. She told me that she had tried to warn me about that grove. She said it was a tragedy what had happened. But that was the way of the world sometimes. He took a last pull off his beer and launched it into the woods. She said that life is cruel sometimes and that there is an order. Ren had tried to go against that order. He broke the rules, and that cruelty took its revenge. She reminded me that I must never go against that order. Not if I wanted to live amongst nature. I thought about this before shaking my head and telling him that I didn't believe it. People don't just turn into trees, Grandpa. He gave me a strange look and walked into the house. I thought that was the end of the story. But that would be too easy for Grandpa. He woke me up the next morning, about three hours before I wanted to be up, and asked if I wanted to meet Ren. It took my fuzzy brain a few minutes to realize what he was talking about before I remembered the story and asked him if he meant the tree. Yes. Would you like to meet him? I sighed. I didn't have anything going on that day, so I agreed. We walked into the woods, Grandpa ambling along, and hiked for about an hour in the crisp morning air. For a man in his seventies, Grandpa moved with an odd grace through the familiar woods of his childhood. I suppose he always had, but it was more pronounced now that he was old. The squirrels and birds were just starting to get noisy, and I could hear the sounds of the forest as we walked. The wind in the trees, the soft noises of small animals in the brush as they avoided the louder sounds of people, the sigh of leaves as they pushed and pulled towards their inevitable death. Having come here often to see my grandparents, I too had become aware of the sounds and tempers of the Appalachian forest. My cousins and I had often found it beautiful and mysterious, but it could also be fickle and temperamental. Just ask my cousin Jeremy, who had twisted his ankle in a hole, only to find that that hole was the home of a rattlesnake. If you could ask him, since he died while we were getting help, Grandpa led us to a clearing a small stream bubbling beside it with a fresh snow run, and I could see a large, golden-barked tree growing not far from that river. It was towering, probably fifteen feet tall, and as I approached, Grandpa shot a hand out and pointed down. I had nearly stepped into a small stream of honey-colored sap that was trickling away from the tree and making its way toward the river. Don't want two calabash growing so close together, Grandpa chuckled. He greeted the tree as we approached, and came around to its front to touch its trunk. The tree didn't move, didn't speak, but as I came up, I could see a swirl pattern on the front that looked like two huge eyes. The eyes seemed to follow you whenever you moved. Though unsettling, the tree looked no different from any other, except for the color and the weird sap. It wasn't until the wind picked up through the branches, shaking the leaves and making them dance, that I thought I heard a creaky voice say, Hello, Harold, in response to my grandpa's greeting. We spent some time there, just talking that day. It seems I have a lot to learn from grandpa's old stories. Thank you for listening to this episode of Too Scared. For more scary stories, make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening. 
My name is Ari Edwards, and I'll see you next time on Too Scared.